two armies stare at each other from across the battlefield. Each has its own ritual to prepare for battle. Each has its own superstitions and sacred sayings. Each cry out to their god to consecrate their warriors. Assuming that above them on some spiritual plane, the gods of Babylon and the god of Israel are similarly, similarly staring across a heavenly battlefield. Now the god who wins the heavenly battle will, will show their power by giving the earthly armies victory. And the world will see which god is greater, Bel and Nebo, or the Lord. The armies of Babylon crush the armies of Judah. They pour through the holy capital and defile the temple of the Lord. All who stand in their way are slaughtered. Their victory is complete. Now, does this mean the gods of Babylon are more powerful than the God of Israel? Babylon thinks <coughs> so. And they mock the people of Jerusalem as they carry them into captivity. Sing us your holy songs. Sing the songs of the God who couldn't protect you from the might of our gods, our empire. But God speaks through the prophet Isaiah. Revealing a new thing to the people who survived the disaster of the Babylonian conquest. <coughs> Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been born by me from your birth, carried from the womb. Once the people have recovered from the disaster enough that they can imagine again, God shows them something new. I'm a big grammar nerd. Like a big grammar nerd. Like I correct my toddler son's children's books in my head as I'm reading them. <laughs> if you're wondering, they're particularly bad at whom. But the funny thing about grammar is it's not written in stone. Grammar is a tool to describe how language gets used, which means when people use language in new ways, grammar nerds like me get to write new grammar. Theology, statements of what we believe about God, works the same way. Theology tries to describe God, who is, of course, bigger than any human description. And so when God does something unexpected, believers get to write new theology, describe what God is doing. The old understanding of my God can beat up your God doesn't work anymore for the people of Israel. It did not describe their experience of God. And so they got to write new theology. They got to describe God in a new way. And God lets the conquered people in on a secret that would help them to last through their captivity. There is no God but God. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me as though we are alike? The Lord has not been conquered or defeated. The Lord has not been carried off like stolen treasure. The Lord reigns over all creation. There is no other God. Which gives a captive people a sense of pride that they had not had before as oppressed people. They're being punished for a sin, but punishment always comes to an end. The Lord is still reliable, still faithful, still carrying the people the way a mother carries her child. God promises, even to your old age, I am He. Even when you turn gray, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear. I will carry and will save. The motherly image here is important. 
Reminding people that they are from God. They came from God. Their heavenly mother labored with them to make them into who they are. And will not abandon them. Now most of us are more accustomed to seeing God referred to as Father. But this is one of several places in scripture where God is described with feminine imagery. And remember that even from the beginning, God created male and female people in the image of God. God nurtures the people of Judah while they are in captivity and reminds them that God has loved them even from before they were born. And the Lord will also love them and care for them into their old age and every moment in between. But that assurance works in captivity because Judah knows now that the Lord is God and there is no other. Babylon may rule, but the Lord reigns. There is no cosmic battle for the fate of the world. God alone is in control. There's no pantheon of divine beings who debate and govern and argue over the events of history. God alone reigns. There's no superstitious deal-making that will deliver people from danger. God alone saves. There's no reason to make offerings or prayers to idols for a little extra luck in our lives. God alone is worthy of worship. And for the prophet Isaiah, those who worship other gods aren't a threat. They're treated as they were treated in former times. Those who worship other gods are laughable. The prophet Isaiah portrays a goldsmith fashioning an idol for a customer, and it's played as a joke. How can this hunk of metal compare to the Lord? It's ridiculous. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me as though we are alike? Those who lavish gold from the purse, who weigh out silver in scales, they hire a goldsmith who makes it into a god. And then they fall down and worship. Now how are you going to worship as a god something you fished out of your pocket not long ago? Just because some craftsman melted your shiny metal together and shaped it into a, an animal or something, suddenly it's divine? Silliness. Isaiah keeps going. They, they lift it to their shoulders. They carry it. They, they set it in its place and it stands there. It cannot move from its place. <clears throat> if one cries out to it, it does not answer or save anyone from trouble. They build their own God, but then they have to carry it around and put it in its place. Now, why would somebody carry their idol when the Lord promises to carry her covenant people? The idol cannot move from its place, but the Lord can. The Lord moves with the people and goes with them even into exile. And when the people cry out for deliverance, God alone hears their prayers and promises to save. Promises that the salvation is already on its way. Meanwhile, the fancy ingot continues to sit. Gold and silver cannot hear or act. It simply gathers dust and begins to need polishing from time to time. Now, in spite of all the silliness that Isaiah describes, the silliness of a pocket-lent God, idolatry outlives the Babylonian Empire. Our world offers as many glistening golden idols as did the ancient world of Babylon. But in the moment of deepest need, they are silent as they weigh down upon their devotees with crushing ruthless force. Our 21st century idols are, are maybe more subtle than the golden or silver statues of the ancient world. Instead of gold, our idols are made of 
glass and plastic and silicone. And we never leave home without them. Our idols are wood and steel, polymer and aluminum, and we trust them to save us from violence. Our idols are, are people whom we have idolized, such that we cannot even imagine them doing wrong. Our idols are the ideas that can never be questioned. They're the traditions that can never be changed. And it's so easy to rationalize our 21st century idolatries. It's easy to say, I love whatever, but I don't worship it. Therefore, I'm good. I love my new phone, but I don't worship it. I trust my firearm to keep me safe, but I don't worship it. My father always knows best, and we all just have to trust him. But we don't worship him. My politics are solid. And any question of my position is an attack upon me personally. But I don't worship him. I love my tradition and we should keep it the same. But I don't worship him. But we've read Isaiah. We know better than that. We know that God alone is love. We know that God alone keeps us safe. We know that God alone is always faithful. We know that God alone is always worthy of worship. With these other things that get in the way, they're not bad in and of themselves. Until they take the place of God, whom alone we must worship. <coughs> And that kind of thing, that kind of replacing God with something else, is just silly. Because God alone has already saved us. Remember all that we have done and all that God has done for us. And even though we, we feel stuck, or are captives, or are in exile, God has the final outcome firmly in hand. I bring near my deliverance, it is not far off, and my salvation will not tarry. I will put my salvation in Zion, for Israel is my Lord. We are living in exile right now, and God alone is saving us from destruction. God has a firm hold on us all and will not let us go. Not even death. Even death on a cross can separate us from the love of God. Not even our tendency to produce idol after idol because it's easier to worship something that doesn't move because if it moves, then it might require something of us. We can't keep God on the shelf where God answers to us. And neither can we keep Jesus in a tomb. No one is good but God alone, Jesus says. And I wonder when he says that to the man who has called him good teacher, if he's asking him, do you know, when you call me good, do you know that I am God? Because God alone is good. Jesus says, for, all, for God, all things are possible. And therefore, we know that God alone will bring us safely to our destination. God will bring us home. And God, who loves us and who alone is God, will never let us go. Thanks be to God for that.